the talk today is about discovery for new products and services, and it's all about interview techniques. So I'm going to talk a bit about how you set up interviews and the things to remember when you carry out interviews as part of a discovery. To introduce us a little bit, this is our team. That's me in the front there. I'm Francis, I'm CEO of Nightingale. Uh, Michael is standing behind me there. He is my husband and also my business partner. And we set up together in 2016 uh, under a different name. We rebranded last year. Uh, jo is our project manager. She's sitting next to me. And uh, Nancy is our design researcher. So we're a small team, but we work with other companies. We partner and we also use contractors. Uh, the various clients that we worked with down through the years is quite a range. We work a lot with government organisations, so at the Education and Skills Funding Agency, which is part of the Department for Education, Health Education England, which is part of the NHS, Pensions Regulator, which does what it says it does, uh, Lego, which I always stick in there because people know it and because it sounds a bit cool. That was a few years ago. Silk Tide, which is a local uh, Nottingham uh, tech company, and Versa Arthritis, Arthritis, which is a national charity that's just an example of of the types of clients we've worked with this is the basis on which we work basically which is that evidence-based decisions are better decisions so we support clients to gather evidence research understand and use evidence to make decisions design decisions um, decisions around their business model, decisions around marketing, decisions around what product to make even. And we gather all the evidence and the research they need to make good decisions. So discovery, what is it? Well, it's carried out before the product or service is fully formed. And what we find when working with clients is that this element of research is often neglected. There is tends to be a dearth of research and it carried out before the product or service idea is fully formed. It tends to happen is the idea is fully formed and then research happens. The benefit of carrying out a discovery is that it allows you to understand your users and the problem you're trying to solve for them before you start to solve it. So it gives you that uh, perspective on what it is you're trying to solve and who you're trying to solve it for, which increases the chances that your product is going to be successful and useful and actually something people want to buy. It allows you to cover, uncover new ideas and explore concepts. I think this is often the hidden benefit of discovery, which is that it actually can lead you to developing a whole new product that you never thought of, because suddenly you hit on something and say, oh, I didn't realize this was really a problem and actually we could solve this. There is a real need for this thing. The focus is on gathering insights and making links, not on solutions. So it's not on design. It's not on what screens should we have. It's not about, is it a website? Is it an app? Is it a, what technical things should you do? It's about understanding. What's the issue? What's the problem? Who are the users? What could we do for them in theory? And a good discovery will set the whole project up for success. The idea of a discovery is you set the foundation for the whole project. You go back to it constantly throughout the project and say, well, what did we find out in the discovery? Do we know this already about our, our users? And sometimes it highlights the things that you don't know. And so it allows you to fill in those gaps as you're going, make sure that you're not guessing, you're not working on assumptions, you're not making mistakes. In discovery, you're trying to figure out these five things. These are quite a general overview of what you're trying to find out, but they're a very good overview because they really cover all of the things that you should know before you start building a product. And again, as I said, when we work with clients, what we find is the answers to these questions aren't always forthcoming, even when a product is quite well developed. So the first question is, what problem are you solving? Very fundamental. What are you actually trying to do? What are you trying to do for your clients, for your customers, for your users? Who does the problem exist for? That's about your target customer. Why does the problem exist? What causes it? How do your target customers currently solve the problem? And how will your solution be better? And I'll go through each of these individually because it gives you an idea of what you're trying to find out in discovery and potentially what kinds of questions you might want to ask in your interviews and find out from your interviews. So what problem are you solving? 
if you genuinely solve a real problem for your users, your product will, or service will be successful. That's a bit of a no-brainer, but it isn't one that's always taken into account. So when you try to figure out sometimes what is what problem are you actually solving here, it isn't always clear. And many startups fail because there's no real need for their product. I think that's a well-known issue, but it's, it's about the problem that's being solved. And is it a problem that really exists for these users? Many more fail because they don't really solve the problem. So there is a problem, but the solution is just not quite right. It's not right for the user. It's not right for the circumstance or the context. It just doesn't do what it needs to do, basically, in order to be useful. And on top of solving a real problem, you need to be able to solve it in a financially viable way. The business model needs to make sense. And this is another key element of it because sometimes companies come up with a product and the next question is, how are you going to make money from it? And that isn't always clear. And it can end up with a product that is a great product, but actually there is no way to sustain it because there's no way to generate income from it. Who does the problem exist for? So who does this problem affect? Why does it affect that group specifically? And this is about your target audience, your target customer, who your user is. And again, this question isn't always very well defined, especially in startup situations. There's a tendency to want to solve a problem for the whole world. The problem is for solving with solving a problem for the whole world is that 7 billion people are quite different from each other. You, they all have different needs, characteristics. They even just have different incomes. So you need to know who it is that you're actually trying to target. And often, especially in a startup situation, targeting a smaller group of users is much more sensible because it is a more manageable way of starting your product. And then looking into the long run about how you're going to expand into other users is more effective and more manageable of course, that depends on the product. And then once you know who, who are you actually trying to focus on, what are the characteristics of that group of people? What makes them a group? Are they parents of small children? Are they older people with low literacy skills? Are they people with a particular social need? But you should know and understand who those people are. Obviously, they're not homogenous. They will have different characteristics, but there will be things that are relevant to your product, which you should know about them. And what do those characteristics mean for your product? So if, the, if it's a low income group, what are you doing to address that issue when you develop your product? Is it a, a group of people who have specific accessibility needs? How are you addressing that need? Why does the problem exist? And this is about context. It's about understanding the problem in depth, the context, the causes, the complicating factors. No problem exists in a vacuum. There's always other things that feed into why that problem exists. There's always other solutions, other issues that the user is addressing. And there's a context in which they would use your product. It might be in a work situation. It might be in a social situation. But you do need to know the context around it because there's no point in developing a product for a person that requires them to hear what's going on if they work in a noisy environment they can't wear headphones for example it's a very simple example but it's one that I have actually come across how big is the problem and can you actually solve it and again this is a startup issue a lot of the time a lot of startups want to tackle a very big meaty problem often a social issue or something that's related to a social issue the difficulty is trying to solve an enormous problem takes time and potentially there are lots of solutions that have been tried down through the years, down to the centuries that haven't worked. So the question to ask then is, would it be more viable to solve part of the problem or break your overall goal down into more attainable milestones? And that's about not biting off more than you can chew and making it more possible to develop some sort of solution that you can at least base the future of the product on. So you want to, you might do this by focusing on one particular group, user group first. For example, rather than supplying a data tool to all retailers, you might want to explore one particular part of the retail industry, such as clothes retailers or women's clothes retailers or children's clothes retailers, something more specific. The more specific you are, the more you can tailor it to a specific group and understand what works and what doesn't. And that is the key part of developing a successful product. How do your target customers currently solve the problem? And 
this is a revelation, I suppose, to a lot of startups that we work with, because they will often say, how do we know if people are going to use this product? And my answer is always, well, what did they do already? Because unless the problem is completely new, so you're in a totally greenfield area where no one has ever done anything like this before, you're working in space or AR or some really technically advanced field, your customers will have some solution for it. It might be a terrible solution. It might be a piece of paper. It might be a handheld whiteboard. It might be a spreadsheet. It might be any sort of a thing that they use just to make this thing work. Knowing how they currently solve the problem allows you to understand if your solution will work for them. Because you know, okay, this is what they currently do. And I can see from how they do it, this is what they need because they've built it themselves. You know, necessity is the mother of invention. They've put in all the things they need. So I can see from it what it is they need from the solution. And you can also take ideas from their solution. In some cases, all that's needed is for their solution to be tidied up and made more reliable. You might all, all you might need to do is take a spreadsheet that's quite messy and unreliable and put it into a piece of software that is tidy and reliable and it, it doesn't have to be more complicated than that sometimes depending on again on what you're addressing how will your solution be better now this can't necessarily be answered in discovery but you should start thinking about it in discovery because if your solution is no better or is worse than what already exists and obviously people will not choose it they're not going to go for something that's worse than what they already have Knowing and articulating what makes your solution different is a key part of cross crafting your USP, your unique selling point and your marketing message. So what, how are you different? What are you adding? Knowing what you add to the landscape, knowing how you are different to others is very important because you can get lost in the shuffle, especially if you are in a very saturated or over over serviced market. And of course, your differentiator needs to be something that your users actually care about. So they're not really going to care that in 10 years time, you have, you're going to have a fantastic AI solution. They want to know what you can do for them now and what is relevant for them now in their context. And this is always a key element of this process of discovery, which is about identifying assumptions. An answer to any of the questions that I've just listed that isn't backed up by evidence is an assumption, basically, because unless you can say we know this because we have this piece of evidence, we've done this piece of research, this piece of data tells us it, it's better, it's just an assumption. You're just basically guessing or you are using some sort of experience and extrapolating from it. And if you're in a very experienced in an industry, potentially that assumption is correct. But the key thing is that an assumption is has the same value as a guess, basically. It can be an educated guess, but it, it could be right or wrong, but at the very least, it's risky. And that's the problem. And a good discovery challenges assumptions and reduces the risks posed by guesswork. So you take out all of the risky assumptions and guesses and you replace them with things that you actually know, which is the, the focus and the purpose of a discovery process. And again, just as a, as a mantra, a watch word, a watch phrase that we use a lot is that untested assumptions are traps that you set for yourself. And there are lots of things you can't predict when it, we're developing a new product, a pandemic, uh, changes in the market, something else comes along that is remarkably better than your product that you didn't anticipate. But untested assumptions are problems that you set up for yourself and they those traps can get you very quickly in the process of developing the product or they can cause problems 10 years down the road where you suddenly realize, oh, we we thought this was the case and actually this is the case and we should have known that and this is going to cause us a massive problem. And so the, the lesson there is don't set yourself traps, try to de-risk the situation as much as you can before you start moving forward. And so interviews is the focus in terms of what you do in the discovery phase in terms of trying to find these things out. 
And interviews have pros and cons. Obviously, they allow you to answer a lot, but not necessarily all of your discovery questions. So well-designed interviews with the right types of people allows you to get all of that rich information about who your user is, what the problem is, how they solve the problem, you know, what could make that solution better for them. They yield a lot of detail and nuance. It's very rare that an interview doesn't yield something useful. Having a discussion with someone about something will always give you some sort of light bulb where someone will say, oh, yeah, we tried that and it didn't work. Well, the next question is, well, why didn't it work? And finding that out gives you a valuable piece of information, even if it's just one piece of information that you get. One of the cons of interviews, of course, is that they can be difficult to recruit for because it requires a high time commitment from participants. And it's obviously easier for a participant to, to fill in a survey that takes five minutes. And they can be time consuming to both run and analyze because obviously you have to carry out the interview and then you have to analyze quite a lot of content. The, I would say that the investment of time and energy is well worth it because you get a lot more unexpected stuff from interviews than you do from more quantitative methods. But it, it's just something to be aware of in terms of that investment of time. So identifying participants is all part of the fun of trying to uh, run interviews and who you speak to depends on which questions you want to answer, which I know is, is somewhat vague on that front. but. For example, if you're understanding your market, you may you may speak to experts. And again, this is the thing that I don't see startups, especially, but established companies as well, doing enough. There are people out there who have worked in industries for years and years and years, have a wealth of knowledge. They know if a solution has been tried three times before and they know why it didn't work. So speak to them. They may need to be paid for their time, which is fair enough because they have expertise, but they will share that expertise and they will tell you, you know, when your ideas are off the mark or when you're not approaching a, a certain a group of users or a certain market with the right sort of approach or the right sort of attitude. Speaking to users obviously allows you to explore their views, opinions, experiences, pain points, and that, you know, part of that is identifying who your user might be. If you're still identifying your target customer, you might want to speak to a wide range of people. So you need to identify who could this be in terms of who we, we are trying to target and speak to them. Find out who they are, find out their characteristics, find out what where they work, what their context is. And there are a wealth of questions you can answer with just talking to a bunch of people because having that qualitative understanding of the reality of their lives or their working situation is really valuable. The question we always get asked, and this is the hard, one of the hardest one, is how many participants should I have? How many interviews should I carry out in a specific context? And as ever, it depends. If you're speaking to a very specific group of people about a specialized problem, you may need to only speak to one or two people, depending on the circumstances. If you're exploring a much bigger issue with a less well-defined group, you might need eight or more participants. You might need 10 in a particular group to get enough of a widespread across different people. The only rule of thumb I can give for this bit is, is you're aiming for data saturation. So sometimes it's a call you make as you're as you're running the interviews. It, and again, it depends on how you what you're actually looking for and how well defined your issue is. But say, for example, you want run three interviews and all three of them have said these same sorts of things but then you've heard one thing from one of the interviewees that was a bit surprising you might think okay I actually could do with hearing more about that from a similar sort of participant so I'm going to try and source a participant that is similar to them to see if they say the same thing you're trying to corroborate it's like building up evidence for a case if only one person says a thing you can't necessarily rely upon that and say this is a really interesting thing. It could be idiosyncratic. It could be down to their context. So sometimes you have to make a judgment call about, yeah, they're all, we've spoken to five people. They've all said pretty much the same thing. So maybe we need another user who's slightly different to those people because we, I feel like we're getting at the same thing for all of them. We're not really getting anything new. So let's try and move a bit to the left or move a bit to the right, talk to a group that's slightly different in a different context. So there's a lot of judgment that take that comes into play there. And there isn't an easy yardstick that you can use, unfortunately. Some of it is from experience, which is it takes time. 
preparing for the interview, I mean, obviously interviews can be run face to face, via video, via telephone, remote interviews, you know, we've all gotten used to remote kind of working over the last year, but we've, we've always run remote interviews because they're often easier and they're less pressured and less hassle for the participants. So it can be a lot easier for them to just sit at home or in their office and pick up the phone or go on Zoom. It's especially true as well if the person's talking about a difficult topic, they might prefer not to be face to face with you because it can be a little bit uh, confronting, a little bit uncomfortable. It allows them to not be in so much in the spotlight sometimes. Whatever method you use, make sure you can record the interview. Sounds like a simple thing, but uh, just a reminder and having a backup recording is always a good idea because I have a handheld old fashioned voice recorder that you see in those films with journalists from the 1960s and I use those to back up my recordings because the worst thing is to run an interview and then realize oh dear the recording hasn't happened for some reason and a key part of it, and this is housekeeping really, but it's all about data control and, and uh, data, you know, making sure that you're all above board on legal terms and you are respecting the rights of your participant, is that you provide the participant with an information sheet detailing the purpose of the study and how data will be stored and get the consent for the interview to be recorded. Now, the participant might say, I don't want to be recorded, and sometimes people don't, in which case you have to use alternative means either you run the interview with somebody else and they write notes as long as the participant is okay with that or you write notes yourself i'm always wary of writing my own notes in an interview because it's very distracting i have done it and i've done it successfully but it's, it's distracting and it's very tiring so if there is a way to avoid that i would advise to avoid it now i'm just going to quickly go through a consent form um, so I'm just going to bring that up there now just to give you an idea of how it looks. I'm sure most people have seen a consent form of some description, but it's useful just to go through the main points and what they should do. Now, this example, um, just make sure it's up there on the screen. Yeah. So th this example is quite a detailed one. So this would be potentially for some, for one that is more sensitive. I've just put, this is just a fake title, but you should always have a title for your research so that people know how to refer to it. They know what you're calling it and so on. And um, give information about who is carrying out the research, what the purpose is, how will it be carried out? Who do you approach if you have concerns? I'm not going to get into massive detail on this, just to give you a view of what it might look like. Now, this, as I say, is a very detailed one for one that might have sensitive information. So, you know, you might need to reassure your participants that it's voluntary, it's anonymous, their data will be deleted, your name won't be disclosed, um, you'll have confidentiality maintained, your data is stored according to GDPR re regulations. Again, depending on the sensitivity, you might need to state who is able to access the recording so that people can know that they won't their data won't be shared without their consent with other people and um, obviously you know standard data declaration data will only be used for purposes as consent is given and so on and there's different wordings depending on different jurisdictions as well so sometimes you need to be careful about where you're carrying out the research and who with this to, to comply with the different data regulations that might apply we carry out data um, research with Ireland, so we, we have to be careful about how data regulations apply there. And you need to get consent. So you need to have the list of things that the person is explicitly consenting to. So they've been informed of the study. They understand their participation is voluntary. They give a consent for the session to be recorded and for their interview to be quoted without identifying details. And obviously, you need to make sure you, you get that uh, consent and have it you know in the background to make sure you have all your uh, t's crossed and your i's dotted and so on and um, designing interview questions and this is a topic i could do seven or eight hours on so it's it's a broad overview here so anyone who wants to know a bit more about this bit because i think this is a bit that people struggle a little bit with um, you can ask me, obviously, I am approachable, um, but you need to balance what you need to know against what the participant would be able and willing to talk about. And I think 
vague as that sounds, I think that is the most important thing. You, you have to respect your participant. They're giving you time. They're giving you their expertise and their knowledge and their experience. So what you don't want to do is going in, go into the interview as if it's an interrogation. What do you think about X and what do you think about Y and what do you think about Z and what's your opinion on X? It has to be a comfortable conversation where they feel listened to and heard and that they can say what they want to say. It has to be quite open. You, you need to have your list of questions, but the essential thing is that people are experts in their own experiences, thoughts, opinions and needs. So you allow them to share their expertise, give them space to talk. The vast majority of people will give you exactly what you need if you just allow them to speak. And so, again, I think that takes a bit of experience as to what's that question that will open up this area and let them know what you want to talk to them about. And I'll do a bit more on that about prompting in a minute. And the one piece of advice I would give that is, is kind of non-negotiable is avoid hypothetical questions. People find them difficult to answer and they don't provide anything useful. Now, I wouldn't say that's a blanket ban on hypothetical questions because sometimes they're applied, but the ones I have trouble with are, and if you saw a product that did X, would you buy it? A lot of the time people would say, well, I suppose I would. And then what does that tell you? nothing essentially because the people will often say they will do things but they they don't actually do them when it comes down to it and um, so running a great interview I mean the difficult bit here as well as ever is that running a great interview takes experience I'm sure if I listened back to interviews that I did 10 or 15 years ago I would cringe and um, some of it just takes time and actually one thing I don't have written here is that it's always really good if you're learning to do interviews to listen back on your interviews so run the interview run a run a practice interview with a friend or a colleague and listen back to it because it's amazing what you learn from hearing yourself speak now most people say oh I hate hearing myself speak but you just can't avoid it so you know you'll have to get over that to a certain extent even now, listening back to my interviews, I will listen back and as I'm doing a transcript or as I'm, I'm you know, just pulling out insights and I'll think, oh, they said something there and I didn't, I didn't really hear it. I should have followed up with that. I wish I'd asked another question. You do get a feel for that over time, but it's a bit of a tough skill to, to develop. And I would say listening to your own interviews is, is the, really the best way to do it. But in the interview, it's important to strike a balance between allowing the participants face to speak and ensuring the interview stays on topic. And sometimes that's, that balance is very hard to strike with someone who's chatty. I'm a chatty person. I'm sure it would be hard to interview me. Um, you need to be respectful of the fact that you're taking someone's time and that they're there to talk about what they're interested in. So you can't cut them off or say, OK, well, let's not talk about that now. Let's just talk about this because people find that quite confronting. It's a bit disrespectful. So you have to be careful about saying, listening to them, letting them say what they need to say. Say, so, yeah, that's really interesting. And what do you think about and pulling them back into the topic that you are focusing on? There's a bit of skill in that. Be very familiar with your interview script. Use it, but don't rely on it. So have it there either printed out or on the second screen, but don't be referring back to it and don't be saying, oh, hang on a minute, let me just, uh, well, let me look at, let me look at my next question because it's still the conversation. Know what questions you're wanting to ask. If necessary, write some little prompts down for yourself, but be fluent and in control of the, of the interview because that makes the interviewee feel comfortable and listen. If they mention something interesting or unexpected, follow up clarify and confirm key pieces of information. And these are all skills because they're in the moment and because you only have that half an hour or an hour, you, you, it's, it's a snapshot in time. Sometimes you look back and think, oh, I, sh I really should have done X and Y. And you get better that, at that over time. Something to mention here is exploring sensitive or difficult subjects. So working with um, interviewees who are in a difficult situation or are talking about something that is emotional, um, difficult, traumatic, all of those different kind of things. 
ideally the interview should be run by someone who has experience in the area I mean it's very daunting to run a an interview with somebody if you don't feel comfortable with the topic yourself and obviously if you're ever put in a situation where you are expected to carry on out, out an interview with someone and the topic is difficult for you personally I think in that situation you should say I'd rather not. I don't think this is something I can really talk about with somebody. It's too difficult. I don't want to hear about it. I don't want to talk about it. If it isn't possible for someone who has experience in the area to carry out the interview, then a person with expertise and experience should provide advice on the questions and interview structure. And anywhere that you're working, there you will always have to find somebody who has some expertise. And again, that's about respecting your participant, respecting that they are coming to you with their difficult subjects, difficult uh, things to talk about and not being cavalier about it, I suppose, for want of a better term, and just making sure that the interview goes well. In situations with difficult subjects, consent needs to be detailed and explicit so that they, they feel their their data is secure. So going back to the one I, I showed earlier, that would be one for a more sensitive topic because there's lots of detail there about who will see the recording, the fact that the data will be anonymized, the fact that you know it's being stored securely and that kind of thing will make people feel like, okay, I can trust you. This is not something that's going to get leaked to people or my employer won't see it or you know something that would upset them or they would find difficult or worrying. And the key thing is that your participant feels safe and comfortable. If things start to go wrong, address it and close the interview if needed. And obviously, if you're working with a difficult subject you should also have signposting or a way of following up with that person so you should have ideally you should have the charity or support group or whatever it is that is relevant to that topic on hand and say you know I'm working in this space could you give me advice and could you let me know what the support is so I can signpost my participant to it and um, you need to have a lot of scaffolding around it and it's it's a difficult one so I think it's not something that should ever be done without some expertise and some knowledge involved because there's lots of pitfalls potential pitfalls this is just a very basic um, interview structure you know how you should structure the interview and the key things you should do in the interview the one thing I would say, which sounds very obvious, is to introduce yourself again with interviews I've seen that have not gone very well. I've, I've seen the interviewer kind of dive straight in. Oh, you know what we're doing here today. So tell me about. And this bit about inter introducing yourself is to give the person a bit of breathing room, allow them to hear your voice, allow them to kind of settle themselves down and to be reassured that you, you know restate what you're saying so my name is Francis I'm a researcher with Nightingale this project is exploring whatever you're exploring I'd like to talk to you about your experiences and opinions I have a set of, I think it's quite important to say this but I have a set of questions but please feel free to bring up anything that you think might be interesting or relevant because people are often a bit worried that if they go off topic you're going to be a bit annoyed so you have to give them permission to go on a tangent because tangents are always the where you get the best stuff you know bearing in mind also that a tangent can get out of control so that's that's the bit where you have to practice that controlling the interview without keeping it very rigid if at any point you don't want to continue please say so when we can stop the interview and before we begin do you have any questions for me and that's quite an important one people rarely have questions sometimes they'll ask you about the recording sometimes they'll ask you oh is it okay if i talk about x and that gives them the space to feel a bit of control and to ask anything they're not sure about, obviously, and then it, it sets you up for the rest of the interview. And the important bit then is to confirm that you're, ha they're, you're happy for me to record the interview. So even if you have written consent, you ask again, because sometimes people might say at that point, oh, no, actually, I'd rather you didn't because I'm just feeling a bit wobbly and I'd rather not. Tailoring your tone is quite important, and this is about the human element of the interview, of course. Um, so you use open questions. That's kind of a given, really. You don't ask yes or no questions. You obviously keep it open. What do you think about X? Um, what is your opinion? What is your experience? With more specific prompts if needed. So you start with an open question and you narrow it down, and I'll go into prompts in a minute. You always start with an open question about the person themselves. So you don't dive straight into the topic and a very simple one is to begin tell me a bit about yourself and you might you might give them a bit more specific about you know tell me a bit about yourself and how you came to work in this industry because that gives something you know a bit more 
concrete for people to talk about. They might think, oh, do you mean where I'm from or how many kids I have? People can be a bit nervous at the start and don't know exactly where to start. But the, the point for you as an interviewer at this point is to listen to how they speak. So are they very detailed? So do they say, well, I was born in X and I have three children and I, I work in this in this industry and I, I like to do this? Or do they joke? Do they mention something specific? If they do, note it down. You know, something that's quite important, note it down to remind yourself. Uh, but the key thing is to tailor your interview to their style. If they're quite chatty and open and friendly and jokey, then it's worth trying to keep that tone. And if they're quite formal and they don't give a lot of information about themselves, respect that. Maybe they don't want to talk about their family and their work situation. They're just happy to speak about the one thing that you're talking about. If you can take notes without being too distracted, do so. And this is just very quick notes for yourself. And having some sort of shorthand for yourself is quite important. Write down key details so you can follow up and so you don't ask them things they've already mentioned. So sometimes people will jump ahead and answer your fifth question when you're only asking your first. Don't ask them again. Don't make the mistake of saying, oh, and actually, can I ask you? Oh, no, actually, you've, you've answered that already. And, and ask them repeatedly because it can frustrate the participant. Prompting is very important. So you start with open questions and then you prompt to narrow it down. Your interviewee doesn't necessarily know what's important or interesting to you. So they know what they know and they are happy to share what they know. But you need to have prompts to flesh out the detail of the responses. And there's very obvious prompts like, could you tell me more about that? And what, why do you think that? And what do you think happened there? And things that just give a bit more specific um, fleshing out of a specific response. But this is just an example. So if, if, if say a participant says, of course, we always struggled with interpreting the data. Now, in an experienced interview might go, oh, OK, that's interesting. But obviously, you're as a more experienced interviewer, you're saying, OK, interesting. They said the word struggled. So what caused the struggle? We want to know why, obviously, if this is relevant to your your research. And they say the software mostly. Were there specific limitations of the software that made things harder? Yes. For example, the analysis tool wouldn't let you transform the data. It would have been great if we could have. And then the participants off. They're talking about something really interesting for you because they're talking about the problems they had. What would they like to be different? you know, what, what could have helped them more. And so you're, this is gold. You're thinking, great, I've asked them a few different, it took me a few questions to get there, but now they're talking about something that's really relevant. Clarifying is really important. So an inexperienced interviewer will look back on their interview and say, oh, the, the participants said X and Y and Z. And you might look then at the transcript and say, well, where did they actually say that? And you realize, oh, actually, they didn't say any of those things. You think they said them or you interpret it or they implied it or you inferred it from what they said, but actually they didn't say it. And so clarifying is important. So sometimes you want to repeat back to them. What I'm hearing is the main barrier to improvement is the software. Would that be fair to say? And that's what I often say. Actually, that's my words. You don't actually have to use those words. But, you know, sometimes saying what I'm hearing is. And that shows that you're saying this is what I'm getting from it. And it allows the person to say, oh, no, no, that's not what I meant. So you need to give them space to disagree. So they might say, not exactly. There's an issue with talent, too. And so there's expanding on the problem. In what way? Nice prompt is just in what way is that an issue or in what in what sense did you struggle with that? And then, of course, they say, well, finding the right people is difficult. People who understand data can draw genuine insights. So they've said really explicitly now, I'd say it's a real mixture of problems. You can't necessarily separate one from the other. So now you have an explicit statement of what they meant. And finishing up is important. So I won't go too much into this, but you just give the participant room to speak at the end and allow them to follow up and ask questions. And if you've, give, if you've offered an incentive, then mention it at this point, because it can be a little bit awkward if they don't know what to say about it. And sometimes they ask for a follow-up or a summary of the research. It's always nice if someone says, oh, I really enjoyed it, or I'd like to participate more. That's, that's always a good sign. So you can generate a transcript when you're analyzing, and um, there's obviously different methods you can use. We use uh, Tetra Insights, which is a really good transcript uh, generating tool. Um, you can write your own transcript if you feel like it. Uh, that's a lot of work. You can pay someone to write a transcript. 
um, or you can create summary notes of the interview. Obviously, a transcript it has the benefit of having all of the ins and outs and everything the person actually said there. So it is avoids you over interpreting what they've said because you know exactly what they did say. The easy, easiest and most effective method to use for analysis is content analysis using techniques like coding and tagging, which sound a lot fancier than they are, but I'll give you a little rundown of how they work. And the aim is to draw out key themes and insights from across different interviews, identifying commonalities and highlighting differences. You wanna find out, are they all saying something similar? Are they all talking around the same topic? Is there something unusual that one or two users mentioned that wasn't a bit unexpected that maybe we want to explore further? So it's finding out the meat of what they've said and the meaning is really important. So coding is quite simple. I mean, you, I like to use colored highlighting for different types of things within the transcript. So here, obviously, I've highlighted um, knee or, or problems in yellow. So the issue is that none of them really what does what we need to them to do. And you need the right data in order to do that. And that's often also a problem. It's common for data to be messy and incomplete. And with coding, you just code the data. So you, you give a little kind of code to each thing that the person said. It's quite detailed and you can narrow your codes down over time, but it can be a little messy. So actually, I think tagging is a little bit easier to do. And this is similar to coding. You highlight the different kind of key pieces of information. You use different color coding if that works for you. And then you label it. So the first uh, highlight is a pain point around software. The, the other yellow highlighter is a pain point around data completeness. The green here is the need that they've they've uh, mentioned about data format. And the other green is another need about data interpretation. And I suppose the benefit of tagging is that you can kind of go deeper and deeper and deeper with the tagging. And then you can pull all the tags together and see how well they match up with each other across different uh, participants. It's quite involved and it takes time, but it's it's quite useful for figuring out what's important. And as a participatory method, I like to use synthesis workshops, and this is especially good in our situation where we're working with clients, because this is a situation which you pull in all the project stakeholders. And the issue often with research is that it gets a bit neglected or people don't really engage with it. This is a participatory method where all of the project stakeholders receive at least one transcript and they summarize it. You give them some questions to summarize it and they pull out some interesting things. So you don't code it for them. You don't do anything. You just allow them to read it. And if you've not read a transcript before, it sometimes messes with people's heads because it's not you don't often see people's speech written down. So it's quite confusing, but it does allow them to really engage upfront with what people have said. Obviously, it's an anonymized transcript and you should have consent for doing it if you're going to do it as part of the research. At the workshop, at a synthesis workshop, which you do face to face remotely, however, each stakeholder reads out their summary so every person is involved and everyone else writes the important points so they listen and hear what the important points that summary are on a post-it note or a mirror board which obviously you can do remotely and then you group the post-it notes into particular themes and insights where things seem to match with each other and it's a very quick and effective way to analyze transcripts while also getting stakeholders on board with the findings it's people then come back and say oh but in the research it said this and so you, it's lovely to hear them echoing it back or the participant I read said this. So what do we do about that? So they're actually engaged a lot more. And obviously I could do a lot more on that one, but time, time is not on our side. So I won't do too much on that. And the conclusions really of discovery are not simple, but the main thing you want to know is, can, can you answer all of or most of your discovery questions? Do you know what problem you're solving, who you're solving it for, what the context of the problem is? And if you if there are key questions still unanswered, do you need more data? You might need to confirm your findings with quantitative data from surveys. You might need to revisit the goals of the project. Do they still make sense? Do you need to take a new direction? Is the problem you were exploring different to what you expected? In nine times out of 10, the answer is yes. <laughs> and you found something new and you want to then incorporate that into the new approach that you're taking. And you should always use research whenever there are unanswered questions. So you ensure then that all design decisions are evidence-based and that's the ideal situation. It's not always the situation that uh, exists, but that's the one we always hope for and aim for. 
And we are on to questions. So if anyone has a question, do write it in the chat and Michael will read it out to me. Um, or if you'd like to just ask your question verbally, please feel free as well. Just uh, let us know. I've got um, one. Go yeah, go ahead. All right, it's Lucy, not Nicola, Hi. as I was when I uh, joined. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you for that. That was really useful, especially like seeing the examples of, um, of yeah, different bits that you use throughout the process. Um, just going back to the point that you were making about it being quite difficult to um, recruit participants and sort of get them to commit their time to uh, an interview. If... Um, if some people that you approached kind of said, oh, I would like to take part, but could you just send me some written questions? Like, do you think that there's ever a value in doing that? Or do you think it then sort of tips over into being a survey where you need a much larger sample? Yeah, it's a good question because we have had that situation. <clears throat> I think sometimes people are a bit nervous about what they might ask. So they sometimes do that, ask you to send written questions so they know what you're going to ask in advance. And then they will say, oh, yeah, actually, I will talk to you. It's easier if I talk to you about this. So sometimes it's a little bit of a control thing. And so if you do send the questions, that kind of breaks the ice a bit. And then they will actually speak to you. But I would always say if they're willing to answer a set of written questions and they're willing to give you like a written answer, like a piece of text rather than just a yes, no to questions, that's always better than nothing. So I would go ahead and do that in that situation. It's just maybe they're caught for time. They don't want to speak for an hour. They're a little bit nervous about being recorded or whatever. So you have to kind of respect that. But I, we have done it and we have received. Well, actually, in all the situations I can think of, I've sent them the questions and then they've said, you know what, it's easier for me to just talk to you about this. I'll, I'll call you. Yeah. OK, great. Thank you. Hi, hello there. Um... Do you, do you have any sort of specific tips about if people are, you talk about how you change the interview technique, which was really interesting, but if someone is clearly, um, you feel they're not giving as much as you want, are there any specific tips of how to sort of make someone feel more comfortable? Um, I suppose the question you want to ask yourself there is why, why are they not giving what you think they could give? Um, is it that they're a bit nervous? Is it that it's a, it's a topic that they're not keen to talk about? What will sometimes happen is someone will go off on a tangent and talk about something totally irrelevant or they'll start talking about something that's vaguely related. Sometimes people do that because they don't feel they can talk about what you're asking them. They don't feel confident enough um, and they feel that it's too difficult a topic or they don't know enough. And I think it's you have to kind of be sensitive to why they're doing it. I think if they are uncomfortable and it's a topic they don't want to talk about, then you possibly just need to run out the interview and say, OK, I'm not going to pressure them. I'm not going to push them. It's not right. It's not ethical for me to push them to talk about this. So I'm just going to let let us we'll chat. I'll essentially abandon the hope I had of getting more from this and then we'll move on. And I, I'll, you know, lesson learned. But if the person is kind of a bit nervous because they think um, actually what they're talking about, they don't know enough. I think it's about being a bit persistent at that point and going, and, and what would you do in that circumstance? Or what, what would your opinion be? Because sometimes people will say, oh, well, I know that in this circumstance, lots of people in my position would do X. So they're talking very hypothetically about what a person might do. And you say, yeah, and have you ever experienced this? Have you ever been in a situation like that? And, you know, it's trying to be, trying to be, get them to be more specific or trying to move away from hypotheticals um, as much as you can without being pressured and if a person pushes back I would say twice or three times or you know in the most kind of minimal sort of way and that they're kind of not answering your question then let it go because they've they've basically sent the signal I don't know what to say about this I'm maybe not comfortable talking about it. I feel like I don't know what I'm saying on this one so that's it, You're, you've, you've reached the limit. Now, a good example actually I can think of is we were on a project where we were talking to a lot of professionals in a particular um, setup where they have to really sell their product. They have to really sell themselves in terms of their expertise. So what I found with them is that there was a lot of guff and waffle for want of a better term. There were lots of like uh, sound bites and 
marketing speak. So with them, I had to just let them run out of marketing speak, basically. So I had to let them do their little sales spiel about how they were so brilliant and they were the best at their what they do and they're so experienced. And for them, they always got to the end of that at some point. It ran out and then they would go on to, and yeah, what really happens in this situation is X and what I really feel about this is Y and they start being more honest. And sometimes that's just patience. You just go, you're eventually going to open up about this. I'm just going to humor you with this marketing speak. And then you're going to not have any more to say on this front. And then we'll get to the real stuff. I think that takes a bit of experience. I think knowing when a person is just not going to give you any more and you need to cut your losses is is a tough one to learn it's what i've seen with inexperienced interviewers is they're not clear so the person is basically trying to say but what is it that you actually mean you know and sometimes interviewers are trying interviewees i should say are trying to be polite they're not really willing to push back they don't want they don't want to be rude and say i don't get what you mean and so as an interviewer you have to get the skill to go oh, they don't actually understand what i'm saying here so i need to clarify without it becoming awkward there's lots of things there isn't there but i think it's it's about having that sensitivity being able to listen and really hear what the person is saying and being able to pick up on their body language which is great when you can use a video because you get more of their body language and and obviously face to face is easier it's harder on the phone um and to be able to think okay i get why this person's not really being forthcoming here i possibly need to change tack or do something yeah i'd else. say a good thing to do is often if you have an interview that goes a bit like that is listen back to the interview and often you'll find out um, from really paying attention to how they answer the questions, what the issue is, because it could just be that you're asking the question in a way that they're not happy to or comfortable answering. So like if you're asking someone about opinions of something that they aren't necessarily that confident in, they may not be able to answer you or not want to answer you. Whereas if you just ask them, like Francis said, about their actual experiences, if it's something that they have experienced, they'll be much more comfortable talking about actually their experience. Um, so, you know, getting someone to say what their favorite, you know, what's the best, who's the best football club in the world um, is potentially a hard question to answer. Whereas, oh, last time we watched a football match, what did you like about it? Or what was the most enjoyable parts of it? Or last time we, you know, what, what made the team play well or what was good about how the team played? It's much more concrete and you can sort of use your personal experience to answer it. Um, but again, it depends on the person and sort of what the issue is. It's, it's a whole different ball game. If it's a case of the topic itself is so sensitive that they're not happy talking about it, um, then that's yeah more subtle. I think that's a really good point. Actually, go more concrete. The more concrete you get, the more a person feels able to answer it. So what happened yesterday is much easier to answer than what do you think about X. And one thing I learned actually from running research with children is when one of the kids I was researching with turned around and said, can I say no? And I was like, yes, of course you can say no, but he didn't feel like he could say no. And you sometimes have to make that explicit as well. You know, you, it doesn't matter if you don't know anything about this. I'm just asking. And it's fine for you to say no, or I don't know. I, I, I was going to say, I sometimes often find it puts people at ease if I if I just sort of say to them, there, is, there are no right or wrong answers here. We're not looking for a right or wrong answer. Yes, yeah. as Michael said, and you said, it's about your experience. And that's it. It's one, of the nice things about, a bit. it's one of the nice things about us always being external is that we can at the start of the interview say, look, we aren't attached to this. I don't care if, you know, especially later on, not necessarily discovery, but where we're showing people designs and stuff. The advantage we have is that it's, we, there's no skin off our nose. If you think this is awful, that's fine. And you can say that at the start of the interview and just say, look, we're not attached to this. You're not going to upset anyone if you think this is rubbish. Um, so just sort of giving people that excuse to be honest, I suppose, and, and sort of explicitly saying it is, is always helpful. Yes, I agree. Uh, thank you. Right, a couple of minutes left. Any other final questions before we wrap up? All good. Thank you yep. very much for uh, for joining us. We're quite a small group, I can see now at the end, but it's it's been good anyway to chat you through uh, interview techniques. If you want to know any more, please do get in contact. And we, we write blogs and talk about these things all the time. So there's always stuff on our website as well if you want to find out more about different techniques. And we'll finish up there. And